Welcome to the Small World Forum Ecosystem Day and to this exciting panel on the role of technology in accelerating the attainment of sustainable development goal number three. And before you go ahead and, and Google which one that was, I'll tell you it's the SDG related to um, ensuring healthy lives and well-being for all at, at all ages. My name is Ibrahim Mahboub. I uh, work as a program director as part of data.org, uh, which is a platform that aims at strengthening the data science for social impact sector. And within that team, I lead a program called Epiverse that aims specifically uh, to invest in data science applications in uh, the field of epidemic preparedness and response. But today I have the, the fun and exciting job of moderating this panel um, between you, first of all, this is not a webinar. We were hoping to get your questions and, and comments and learn more about your vision for uh, technology in health. Um, so you, as well as four amazing leaders from the space of uh, technology in health, each of them bring a lot of uh, unique experience and brilliance and energy and passion to this field of work. And I, for one, have been learning so much just by watching uh, their steps and, um, uh, and following their successes. Uh, and so today we're going to be discussing the, uh, the role of technology in, in achieving uh, health and well-being uh, for everyone, uh, learning from the experience of our panelists, as well as your inputs and, and questions and, and insights. So please always feel free to, to write us something in the chat and towards the end I'll be sure uh, to read your comments and questions to the panelists and, and make sure we address them all. So the, our program for today is that first I'm going to be asking our panelists to come to the virtual stage and uh, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their work and their background, uh, and share with us what they find most promising about the use of technology in health today and what is their biggest concern, what keeps, keeps them up at night. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, I'll, I'll be going through uh, a few questions I've prepared uh, for each of them, and then I'll be handing uh, to you for your questions and, and comments. So let's start um, by uh, bringing our panelists to the virtual stage. Uh, first, I, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Sky Yudin and uh, Sky, thank you so much for joining us this early your time. I mean, I hope you at least had a chance to get your coffee. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, it's really lovely to be here today and to have this conversation. Uh, it's a great topic. My name is, as Ibrahim said, Sky Odin. I'm the executive director of Digital Square at PATH. And a little bit about me, I got my start in an evolutionary psychology lab doing a lot of research on game theory. Uh, and I first intersected with the health sector when I was doing cross-cultural research in Senegal. Uh, and as I was conducting focus groups, uh, I, I encountered a lot of equity issues that, um, that made my prior work in a lab feel very, not have as much meaning. And so uh, that for me was a huge pivot in my career. And I ended up uh, doing public health research for a while and then management consulting in the health sector uh, investments and finally landed in this role uh, at Digital Square. And for those of you who don't know Digital Square, uh, we're a six-year-old initiative uh, and we, our mission is to connect health leaders with the resources necessary for digital transformation. And those resources can be access to financing from our cohort of 15 investors. They can be peer learning and exchange across the, the 15 or so countries where we're currently in, in partnership. Uh, it can be access to technical expertise and uh, around things like how to comply to fire standards or the World Health Organization's digital adoption kits. Uh, it can be access to and recommendations on uh, mature digital public goods uh, called global goods that, that might be good fits for, for solutions. So uh, that's a little bit about me and about Digital Square. Uh, you know, in terms of in terms of SDG3 and what I'm most excited about, uh, I really think that digital brings a lot of promise in improving access to health services throughout the world. 
Uh, we're looking at a pretty substantial health worker shortage by 2030, numbering in the millions. And there's a lot of promise of digital tools to extend the reach and ensure availability of medical commodities, ensure folks have access to health information uh, and, and potentially providers where they may not be readily available physically in communities. And so I'm really excited about the promise of digital in, in just extending that access and uh, making healthcare more equitably available to all. My biggest concern or <laughs> a stress around uh, achieving SDG3 is, is the governance around how those digital tools uh, get rolled out. I think there is, uh, I think that the, the, mo the way we can best achieve equity is to confer decision-making around governance and around policy and around what tools get rolled out uh, to communities and those that represent them like governing bodies. And, uh, and there is a legacy in, uh, in global health and in development overall of that decision-making happening with funders and, and with implementing agencies. And so I'm really interested in seeing decision-making uh, go more and more towards communities and, and towards uh, government representatives. And, uh, and I think that moving in that direction will assure equity and access. Back over to you, Ibrahim. Thank you so much, uh, Sky. And uh, I totally agree with you. And I, uh, I hear your concern, especially around uh, the decision making process and making sure that it's uh, as inclusive and equitable and transparent as possible. Um, really great to have you and looking forward to our discussion. Uh, next, I would like to invite um, Sean Blaschke, who is a, a former colleague. I had the privilege of working with Sean uh, in my UNICEF days, uh, and I learned a huge deal by, uh, by working with him. So uh, Sean, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and um, what uh, gets you excited in the, in the state of uh, digital health today, uh, and what is your biggest concern? Fabulous, Ibrahim. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to uh, join this uh, panel today and I'm very excited to uh, speak on a uh, topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, as Ibrahim mentioned, my name is Sean Blaschke. I'm a senior health specialist with UNICEF HQ. Uh, I'm also the global coordinator of the joint UNICEF and WHO Digital Health Center of Excellence, or DICE. Um, DICE was just quickly, DICE was established uh, to improve uh, and support donor coordination uh, around uh, digital health and to uh, support uh, capacity, uh, particularly at regional and country level, uh, to ensure the promise that we've, we've been speaking about uh, for many years of digital health really does lead to country ownership and uh, sustainable and scalable platforms. Uh, and uh, you know, I just wanted to give a quick uh, shout out again to the Digital Square team. They are a critical member of the DICE consortium, uh, really showing uh, fabulous leadership, uh, particularly around the digital public good, global good space. Uh, so what, what really excites me, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we, we, we saw um, going into the COVID pandemic, uh, which, which really accelerated, uh, was government recognition, particularly in lower and middle income countries, uh, on um, the importance of mainstreaming uh, digital. Uh, a lot of prior digital interventions uh, tend to be very projectized. Uh, they were um, not seen as part of the core way that government should invest in delivering um, health uh, results. Uh, but this, is, this has been, been, been changing uh, and, 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 and very rapidly uh, so in the last couple of years. Uh, we've, we've seen governments now uh, coming to donors and uh, asking us, you know, uh, we want to see you uh, supporting a enterprise planning approach. Uh, we want to see better adoption of uh, standards. Uh, we we want to know whether your tools um, are aligned with WHO guidelines like the, like the, the, the DACs. Um, and um, you know, I think this has really demonstrated a, a, a maturity um, across the field um, with, within the digital public goods as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're no longer in a space uh, where we're trying to build new tools. Um, we have, uh, you know, across each of the different uh, WHO digital health system domains, 
uh, a growing number of, of uh, options that have been tested in, 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 in you know, across multiple countries and context uh, at scale. Um, we're, we're starting to see far more patient-centric platforms. Uh, for those who've worked in this field uh, for 10 plus years, uh, you know, you'll know that uh, kind of the, the early stages of digital health were largely driven by health informatics, monitoring evaluation, HMIS, which are absolutely critical. Um, but uh, we didn't have um, as many uh, tools uh, that were focused on improving service delivery, uh, particularly at the last mile. And uh, finally, again, we're, I think we're starting to see private sector companies um, stepping up and uh, showing leadership uh, and uh, demonstrating that uh, open source um, is an area that uh, they, can, they can engage and uh, profit from. I think in particular, Google and their work uh, with uh, Fire, uh, I think is a, a tremendous example of this. Uh, in terms of challenges, things that keep me up at night, um, you know, I think we still struggle with consistent and long-term funding. Uh, the, the, the money put in is still in these one, two-year cycles, and, and digital transformation is a, a long process. Uh, and, and, and finally, I, I, I would say a lot of the funding incentives um, to, 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 to partners um, you know, are, are, are still prioritizing inputs rather than outcomes. And, and, and we need to stop looking at um, how many devices are deployed, how many SMSs are sent, uh, how many uh, health workers are, are trained and, and, and start to look at uh, and start to, 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 to uh, put in place performance management and payment systems uh, and innovative financing that uh, allows uh, our partners to be more creative and focused on what they're achieving uh, rather than what they're putting in. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sean. And um, I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, funding still remains a challenge. Uh, and it, it, it's always good to, to hear you speak with such enthusiasm and positivity, especially because I know how challenging uh, your role is. And, and so um, uh, if you're still very positive and hopeful, then it, it gives me yet another reason to be um, optimistic and, and hopeful. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, next, I, I would like to give the floor to uh, Philip Abdel Malik uh, from WHO, um, who is also a, an a advisor for Epiverse uh, program. Uh, Philip, always a privilege to, to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Thank you for having me on this panel. Also a pleasure to be here. Um, very quickly, my background is in epidemiology and public health informatics, and to be honest, I'd rather spend most of my five minutes not talking about myself. So maybe I'll just quickly say that I currently lead a team <coughs> within uh, WHO here at the World Health Organization that focuses on public health intelligence and specifically innovation and integration of solutions for public health intelligence. And that team predates the new WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence and is now a cornerstone of the hub, hence the shameless advertising behind me. Uh, I've spent most of my career in public health, emergency preparedness and response. And particularly I've been focused on surveillance and intelligence as core public health functions, not just their application, but also uh, training, development of training material and its delivery, as well as how we incorporate technology into those functions and the various activities and augment that capacity. So maybe since I've mentioned technology just now, it's a good segue to sort of what is exciting and what concerns me uh, about its use in, uh, in the SDGs and particularly SDG3. Uh, I mean, first of all, of course, technology is not a silver bullet. It won't solve all of the world's problems or all the SDGs, but I think it's a, it's a key ingredient and also a facilitator for the SDGs in general. And, and given the complex, I think, interactions um, between all of the different SDGs and also just um, how we use technology and see it developing at an exponential rate, um, it becomes really crucial to tap into those different aspects to, to address some of these issues. Um, so I think, you know, its uses range, of course, from personal individual uses to monitor and track uh, personal health and well-being through to clinic, clinical care, um, public health uh, capacity, public health um, practice, and of course, public health research, all towards SDG3, which is, as you mentioned, around uh, healthy lives and promoting well-being at all ages. 
I think what excites me most about technology is that it is a platform for connecting us. And by that, I don't mean uh, social media. I mean, there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of um, different platforms uh, for, for engaging. That's not what I mean. What I mean is more that technology has created an environment for us to collaborate across different disciplines, um, sectors, and jurisdictions to come around common problems to try to address them. And as such, I think when we apply that um, ethically, responsibly, and equitably, it has tremendous, tremendous potential to help us um, move things forward in achieving the SDGs and, and SDG3. Um, and whether that's idea of generation or cross-disciplinary co-development uh, or joint implementation, I think those are all ways that we can bring people together around these common problems using technology um, to address, address those challenges. At, at the same time, on the flip side, this can be misused or abused. And that, um, even some people on my team will tell you that I, I keep talking about this and, and it keeps me up at night. Um, because that misuse and abuse, we already see it um, in certain ways, and that can have really destructive implications. Um, and sometimes they're not intended either. Um, and that's, that's even uh, more scary sometimes. So that's one of my biggest concerns, I think, not the technology itself and not the power that that gives us, but rather the effect of that power on our own behaviors, attitudes, biases, egos, mindsets, etc. Ties in, I think, a little bit with what Sky was talking about in terms of governance, but from a slightly different angle, not so much about the decision making at the end, but the decision making throughout um, in terms of how things are applied and how we govern that application. Um, so I think my biggest concern is in how technology is being used um, is how is technology being used? Uh, and in that way, I guess my biggest concern is us. So I'll hand over back to you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Philip. I, uh, I I totally hear you, and it's sometimes very easy to uh, discount the human factor when we're talking about technology. Um, uh, so thank you so much for for highlighting that. Um, last but not least, I I would like to give the floor to uh, Anna Carnegie, who leads a very exciting initiative at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, called Epiverse Trace. Um, uh, Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, pleased and, and privileged to have you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Ibrahim. Amazing to be here. And so, as Ibrahim said, my name is Anna Carnegie. I am based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And my background is in social science and user engagement and involvement in research. And I've been based at the London School Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases for the past four years. Um, and I recently took up the role of Epiverse Community Manager in February. Um, and for those who don't know that much about it, Epiverse Trace is a cross-partner initiative. So we span collaborations in Colombia, the Gambia and England, uh, and hopefully bring more partners on board soon um, and our objective is really to develop generalizable scalable and community driven software for epidemic preparedness and response um, and touching on that then when thinking about what i'm most excited about uh, about technology being used for sdg3 it really is i think COVID really spurred a wave of activity around um, investment in tech solutions that are more sustained and long-term that can really, from the environment that I work in, provide huge promise for how academic institutions intersect and work alongside public health agencies. Um, so instead of how traditional metrics of academia have worked, where research is, or funding is provided on them, the basis of answering a specific research question. We're really moving, it seems like we're moving into a space now where there is this um, this recognition of the need to invest in um, solutions that can be more sustainable and provide dedicated fund funding upfront for the development of um, software tools 
Um, and also within that, making space, dedicated space and funding availability for collaboration and connection with those end users who are really crucial um, and really need to be informing the kind of products and digital tools that we are developing. Um, and so thinking about what my concerns are and the other panelists have touched on some really relevant ones that I'd be looking forward to digging into a bit. Um, for me, it's really maintaining and sustaining the momentum. Um, so yeah, COVID has brought into sharp focus the need to address these things in a more sustained and long-term manner. And I guess my question, my concern is, how do we ensure that investment in these initiatives continues? Thank you, Anna. I, it, it, that's a really valid concern. And I think it, it's important to think of how do we uh, ensure that um, beyond the urgency of, uh, of one public health crisis, we're, we're still able to invest in, in kind of the technology solutions that are needed for the future. Um, so thank you so much for highlighting, highlighting that. And be, before we dive into the visions of um, the panelists for what kind of future we're heading towards and, and what would we like that to be, uh, I'd really like to get an idea um, about your vision uh, as uh, participants in, in the panel. So um, we, we have planned a quick uh, poll uh, for you. Uh, to ask you specifically, um, it, it should have popped up in, on your screen right now. What do you think is the most crucial component of accelerating progress on SDG number three, which is ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages? Um, would that be funding? As uh, Sean mentioned, uh, I mean, what can you do without funding? Uh, is it capacity building and, and access to health systems? We've seen a, a number of countries around the world have been and still are struggling uh, to increase the capacity of their health systems to, to be able to respond uh, to different crises, including COVID-19. Uh, is it uh, technology solutions? A, a lot of my friends in the private sector, especially, uh, would, would make an argument that if the product is good, if the tech is good, it should work. Um, and uh, is it available data? Uh, uh, because without uh, good data, you can't really uh, generate much insight. And uh, last but not least, transparent and open governance. Fantastic. So the results are in. We have 33% um, to funding, 44% to capacity, and uh 22 percent to available data um that that is very very interesting um uh and and no votes to technology solutions or uh transparent and open governance it, this is super interesting because it, it, i think funding and capacity and available data uh, are are absolutely crucial and it, obviously the, there is no right answer here uh, all of these are super important factors uh, to achieving SDG three, and um, and not uh, one of them would would work alone. Uh, but it's great to see kind of what speaks um, more to you. And if you kind of had the magic ability to transform one of these factors and make it ten times better overnight, which one would you choose? And uh, and so it's good to hear that a lot of you would invest more in uh, in the promising technology solutions, digital public goods, and global goods. Um, you would also invest in, in capacity and availing more data. So this is uh, all super exciting. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to answer the poll. It's, it's fantastic to have you. And please feel free to, uh, to continue challenging what we propose and, and share your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, I, um, I will be sure to, to read all of them in the Q&A section. So uh, my first question, uh, let's start with you, Sky. Um, 
uh, I've been following with great admiration the, the progress by the Digital Square team. And uh, as you've heard uh, on the panel already, a couple of shout outs to, to the great work that the team has been doing, bringing people together. Uh, and so I want my first question to you, why is it so important to bring people together and to agree on standards and, and, and well-defined plan for collaborative action? Why can't we just go about and everybody does their own thing? Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, can you speak a little bit about that? There is, there is also a, a term that I, I, I hear you mention often and I really love it, that ecosystem of choice. Yeah. So if you can speak a little bit about the relationship between these uh, two concepts. Yeah, um, I think that uh, there's different layers of coordination and alignment and maybe the easiest way to, to talk about the value of it is through thinking about the pandemic over the last two years. Um, and I can speak to a couple of things that places where we've seen it come together through deep partnership with, with UNICEF and others. Um, one would be our map and match work. So uh, a couple of years ago now, or maybe a year and a half, we, we started bringing um, community together to regularly um, co-create and discuss, you know, uh, how do we, given lessons learned from the Ebola outbreak in 2014 and 15 in West Africa, um, and how information systems were used in that context, what can we learn from that, and what can we do better this time around? And uh, a couple of things that, that came out of these conversations was uh, a really nice publication that was collaborated on by uh, five or six different organizations that really mapped different kinds of uh, digital, like types of digital tools that might be more or less useful at various phases in the pandemic. Um, so this was uh, uh, mapping digital tools across an epidemiology curve. And this publication, uh, because so many uh, funders and other community members aligned on the publication, it then became something that was used and built a common language that we could all use collectively to think about what tools might work in what context. And so um, you then saw that tool being used uh, in conversations GIZ was having, in conversations USAID was having, in conversations others were having, and, and you didn't have country governments or other folks having to learn four or five different taxonomies. They had a common one for these conversations. And so it saved a lot of time and made um, alignment of, of financial resources a lot easier. Um, another uh, really great, um, and I think another really great value of alignment is, and one of the highest is the efficient allocation of resources. So um, if you don't, uh, if you don't align, you can sometimes have multiple funders fund the same thing and not know. Uh, and so if you, but if there is really good information exchange and transparency, um, what you then can do is um, instead of having two people fund one thing, uh, you can double your impact or, or magnify it by having complementary funding streams. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of value there. Um, I would also say that there is um, beyond the funding side, on the technical side, there's huge value in coordination and alignment because if you are aligning to common data standards, and this is particularly relevant for data science, uh, then data exchange becomes a lot easier and cheaper, and you're not having to hire tons of people to do data cleaning. Uh, and so I, it saves a lot of costs. Uh, and long term at the analytic phase, um, if you're thoughtful about the, the design of the standards and the use. And so I think there's a lot of important coordination alignment on the technical side as well that can save resources. Um, I think that what all this does is if you're able to save resources and not duplicatively fund, then you can more easily achieve that ecosystem of choice that we talk about a lot. And the goal there is um, is to avoid uh, a, an ecosystem where um, country governments and communities can have only one choice of a digital tool. Because if you have only one choice of a digital tool, that's, that's basically you, you're, um, you're a consumer of a, of a monopoly product. And in markets, 
um, monopolies generally risk not creating a healthy ecosystem because it can, it aggregates and concentrates power uh, in the ecosystem. Um, and and if and if something goes wrong with that one product, everyone's out. Um, think about you know Amazon Cloud three or four years ago was down for like. I don't know, half a day. And because they had 30 to 40% of the market, there was like billions of dollars lost for that period of time. Uh, and and that they didn't weren't even a monopoly. They like don't even have more than 50% of the market. And so um you can, you know, in the vaccine sector, um, the 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 small number of manufacturers of measles vaccine can create a lot of challenges in, in equitable distribution of measles vaccine and, and adequate supply. So um so I think we really want an ecosystem of choice to make sure. That, um, that we have a healthy supply uh, for countries and, uh, and they're not locked into one solution that, that may be a little bit fragile. Over here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance to, uh, to strike uh, um, between um, too, too many options to choose from and, and too few. Um, uh, and so I, I think uh, your approach to, to, to maintaining that balance, I think, is, is really good. And I also witnessed how the Map and uh, Match project really benefited a lot of decision makers in the space. And, and it made some of the usually difficult decisions a little bit easier. And, and, and that's really great to see. Um, I have another question for you. If you had to choose one thing you're particularly proud out of of what the team has uh, has achieved over the past six years what would you choose oh that <laughs> I know. question um i think that this is going to be very abstract and it's very hard to measure but i think that there was a lot of really good 10 10 to even 15 years ago global publications like the principles for digital development that people aspire to, but it was hard to live them day in and day out. And I like to think that the work that Digital Square has done over the last six years has made it easier for everyone to live by those principles. Um, and I think also that that there is broader global alignment on those principles. That is my hope. Um, and I, yeah, I think that there are, it is a hard thing to measure and to quantify, uh, but there are moments over the last six years where I've seen collective decision-making go in a positive direction. Um, and I've been really excited and energized by that. Yeah, I agree. I think that one particularly was a huge moment and, and, and a big milestone. Uh, I think you made a good choice. The, the, that was a tough question, I know, given the, the many amazing things that the, the team has done. Um, thank you, Sky. It, it, Sean, if, um, uh, as I said before, uh, everybody, uh, I, I had the, the pleasure and the privilege of working with Sean and UNICEF, and uh, it, it, uh, I spoke a little bit about how difficult I think uh, and challenging his, his role is. Uh, Sean, I would love for you to speak a little bit about your experience supporting many country teams in different contexts and, uh, and particularly guiding the implementation of technology uh, solutions in, um, in very different environments. Um, it, why is it so important to invest in local capacity? Why isn't good tech enough, as uh, some of my friends would say? Well, good, good, good tech is a start, um, but you know I think as uh, you know we've commonly said tech is only ten percent of the solution, and uh, you know uh, the the last poll that you showed uh, or um, uh, showcase I think really does demonstrate that uh, this is now a a widely accepted component of uh, implementing. I digital think Sean program. might be. Uh, oh, my own... Can you hear me? Hello, hello. I should not be on mute. Ibrahim, can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Um, maybe maybe it's just Ibrahim here. Um, fabulous. So um, you're just talking a bit about local capacity. Um, you know, every digital tool, no matter how well designed it is, um, requires uh, local local adaption to local context. 
Uh, you know, additionally, uh, tech should not be seen and this adaption should not be seen as a once off, but a continuous process. And again, this is something that, um, you know, we, we often see cut out of um, uh, development partner donor, uh, partner supported programs uh, when they're looking to squeeze budgets and it's, it's, it's one of the worst areas to cut. Um, you know, as tools are, our, our digital tools are rolled out, um, you know, we, we learn things, um, you know, how they are being accepted by uh, our target audience. Uh, we, 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 we start to see, um, you know, the, the types of uh, ways that they interact with them and, and, and uh, you know, what kind of information they're generating. And, and this does require um, the capacity um, of people to continuously uh, configure, uh, adapt, and improve these programs. I, I, I think also um, we need to, 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 to recognize that, um, you know, we're, we're often working with legacy business processes. And if we just try to um, put tech into a civil registration and vital statistics program uh, that was designed 50 years ago, um, uh, you know, through, through kind of a, you know, a paper-based archaic system, uh, that, uh, you know, this is probably going to be a very inefficient use of, of technology. Uh, so really understanding those, those user journeys, those workflows is, is key. Uh, and, um, you know, understanding that this is going to, to, to require, uh, again, a continuous process, you know, where maybe one donor is supporting this today, maybe uh, government is able to, 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 to finance it nationally tomorrow. Um, and, and, and you really do require continuity of support and a strong understanding of the, 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 the local ecosystem for, for this to be successful. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, this is something that we're, we're, we're increasingly seeing um, our, our, our government partners uh, requiring. They, they, they do not want to be beholden uh, to, um, to, 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 to people outside their country, people who don't have necessarily the same interests in mind. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, understanding and, and recognizing change management and capacity are, um, you know, just such critical components to the success of a program. Yeah, that that makes perfect sense. And um, I apologize, I got disconnected for a second, but I, I caught um, uh, all of uh, your response. Thank you, Sean. It, 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 as a follow up, there is a, a term that gets stressed a lot in in uh, in these conversations and, and in our space, and that is interoperability. Uh, what are your thoughts on the relationship between interoperability and scalability? Why? Why is it so important? So I, mean, I, I think interoperability and scalability are directly linked. Um, I mean, I think first we need to we need to be careful how we use the term interoperability. We we often use it when we're talking about integration, uh, and, and interoperability actually has you know takes a far more complex uh, approach and you know an enterprise architecture approach where you're looking at um, you know shared assets, shared registries, shared terminology services, uh, the ability um, for for multiple tools uh, uh, to, to to connect. Uh, through through health information exchanges, and um, you know what what does that actually mean uh, in terms of um, facilitating and enabling scalability? Uh, you know, I'll talk about this on two very quickly on two different levels. Um, you know, first at the health service delivery level, uh, frontline health workers. They're um, you know as more and more tools are being introduced, they're they're increasingly being burdened um, by projectized disease vertical platforms, uh, and if we don't look at this from a service delivery platform perspective um, rather than what me as as my organization wants or um, you know the specific um, government program uh, driving very very specific results um, you know we, we, we end up with systems uh, that don't fulfill the promise of efficiency we always talk about digital tools reducing the workload on, 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 on health workers. But in reality, if we're not careful, digital tools can actually increase this. Um, at national level, um, you know, what, what we're seeing uh, is that, uh, you know, if, if we don't look at that underlying infrastructure from an interoperability rather than an integration perspective, we may end up with multiple master facility registries, multiple master health workforce registries. Um, what, what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, uh, you know what 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 ends up resulting from this uh, is again a greater um, effort. You know you have um, you know people at, at at national level having to manage three or four or five different databases registries that serve the same function. 
uh, when you're trying to um, gather insights uh, in, you know, there's a disease outbreak here. What is the impact um, for, for education? What is, what is, what, it, you know, how is this, um, you know, uh, threatening the nutritional status of, um, you know, children in this community? Uh, you know, you end up not being able to compare data uh, because you've versioned uh, these really, really critical um, uh, underlying uh, you know, databases. And so when we look at interoperability, um, it shouldn't be interoperability and scalability. It, you know, uh, if we don't invest in interoperability, we, we are not going to uh, achieve any, any scalability. That makes sense. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. And uh, I love how you stressed kind of the uh, the cost of digital technology uh, in terms of behavioral change required by the users and that it can sometimes, if overlooked, be a burden rather than uh, a tool that, that makes uh, life easier. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, my, my next question is uh, to you, Philip. Uh, I'm uh, sure a lot of um, uh, technologists and, uh, and people uh, maybe who are working outside of the space of global health, but really have uh, uh, a lot of technical expertise that they could bring to the table. And maybe hearing about the, the work of the WHO uh, Berlin hub uh, and thinking, oh, I would love to be able to support and contribute to that work. Can you speak a little bit to uh, some of the engagement opportunities that uh, the Berlin hub would be uh, creating? Um, for those people. Yeah, thanks, Ibrahim. And you know, I'm happy to, to also, uh, people are free to, to connect with me to go into some of the details, but I'll try to give a general overview just in a few minutes. Um, I think first though, it might be good to, to articulate a little bit what the mission of the hub is, because then that gives some context to then the, the technology components. Um, and, and ultimately, what we've defined as our mission within the hub is to really support countries as well as regional and global actors in averting uh, and also managing public health threats. But specifically through, um, and you'll see it behind me here, through better data and better analytics, leading them to better decisions. So what does that mean practically in terms of what we're actually trying to do? Um, so I think, uh, first of all, it might be good to frame these um, in terms of four different, let's call them networks, that together create this ecosystem. And I know we've already heard um, the term ecosystem. I think we'll, we'll probably hear it a lot in different contexts. For us, we've been using it to describe this sort of connectedness between different internally connected networks. And those networks are across four key areas that we've defined. Um, those areas are infrastructure, um, information, applications, and communities. And so I'll start maybe with, with the top one and talk a little bit about the what before going in a little bit into the how. Um, in terms of the what, I'll start with communities at the top. And so we're talking about connected communities, and these would be different communities of practice, which of course would require technology experts to be active members of. Um, and these are the communities themselves are the stakeholders who define um, a lot of the requirements and would contribute to and benefit from this ecosystem. Um, so what are they contributing to? What are they benefiting from? And why should technology experts be part, actively part of those connected communities? Well, the next network that, that I mentioned um, or want to mention is the application sort of layer in that, in that um, paradigm. Um, and so here we're talking about connected applications. And of course, technology experts are crucial here for ideation, design, development, integration, and implementation. And again, just acknowledging what was just mentioned by Sean in terms of interoperability, um, but also therefore also designing the underlying foundational frameworks, architecture, governance, et cetera, around those. And what we're ultimately trying to, to do here is to create components that function together, that you can put together sort of in a mesh of microservices, if, if we use that, that sort of language. And what kinds of applications depends, of course, on what the community layer or network um, defines to help achieve that mission that I spoke about. Um, and so, more and more and increasingly, we're seeing the need for experts in natural language processing or computational linguistics, machine learning, um, 
uh, GIS, and of course the ability to create out of these communities experts who can then also annotate defined taxonomies or ontology schemas that will support the development of these applications. Having spoken about that, that sort of is a good segue to the next network, which, which is a different sort of set of specializations in a way, and that's the information or data network. All the applications will need data. We've heard a little bit about data being one of the, the um, critical things that I think the, the audience mentioned in terms of SDG3. Um, and so what we're hoping to do or looking to do through the hub and what we started exploring is how to create a globally linked network of data. So the idea here is not to centralize or report the data at WHO, we're not, that is not our role here at the World Health Organization, but rather how do we define ways that allow us to connect data where it resides so that we can draw insights, not just from the data elements themselves that are in those data sets, but equally as important, if not more important, the relationships between those data elements. Um, and for that, what we're talking about is really creating a global um, graph, a knowledge graph of data. So think of it kind of like a semantic web of data. Um, and that would be what would feed, the communities would feed into, and then that would feed the applications to deliver insights to the communities for making better decisions. So we're looking at graph database experts, architects, again, knowledge engineers, um, maybe skill sets that are a little bit more specialized uh, in some of these areas um, and therefore not, not very common, but that are crucial to getting this right. And then the last network um, really is that infrastructure that supports all of this. And here we're looking at hybrid cloud computing, ways that allow us you know, having talked a little bit about interoperability above both in information and application, now this is where we talk about scalability to a large extent and being able to support um, the growth and evolution of those three other networks. Um, and so together, the interactions across these networks and within them is what we consider to be the ecosystem that we're trying to build and nurture, not just by ourselves, of course, with others and uh, data.org and Epiverse are, are crucial in this, particularly when we think about Epiverse and that application uh, network or application layer. Um, in terms of the, the how, um, how we wanna enable all this, we're, we're, we're looking right now to establish and build mechanisms that, that allow us to have some cross-disciplinary teams working physically together um, at the new hub location in Berlin. Of course, that's limited in terms of uh, space, and we want to make sure that there's equitable contribution and access to, to um, participation and also use of what's developed. Um, and so we're, we're in the process of um, looking at how we build a virtual collaboration space that would allow all of this to happen. Um, so a collaborative laboratory or collaboratory. And within that, what we also want to make sure we have are libraries of components based on this kind of framework and architecture that I, I just attempted to describe. Uh, components that can be reused, um, adapted, adopted, um, or new ones created and, and put there to allow this community to grow and build new things on top of existing things and look at how we connect things. So really connected components. Um, and part of that, uh, of course, requires open source governance, which we're also exploring. So I think those are some of the, the key areas that technology experts can engage in on a, on a high level. And we do have very specific projects, which, uh, which I can go into at another point in time where people can connect with me directly if they'd like. That's fantastic to hear, uh, Philip. And thank you so much for um, explaining kind of these uh, three layers and stressing the importance of thinking about the relationships between the data, not just uh, um, it, it, trying to open as, as much data as possible, but also to keep an eye on how these data sets relate to each other. Uh, that's, that's really important. Thank you. Um, uh, last but not least, I, I would love to uh, ask you, Anna, uh, about your program and, and the work of the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine. Um, it, how, uh, do you all at LSHTM envision building on progress already made uh, and uh, existing initiatives 
to uh, to capitalize on that for advancing the field of uh, outbreak analytics. Thanks, Ibrahim. Um, I suppose I, I'll start by talking about some of the work that has been done in recent months and years and really um, lay some of the groundwork for the types of transferable tools we're hoping to develop from Epiverse and really inspired the approach. Um, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of packages um, which were developed by some of my colleagues and co-leads at LSHTM um, and they were developed to measure the effect of reproduction number and um, throughout the pandemic called EpiNow packages and um, they were refined and redeveloped based on user feedback uh, and ended up uh, being a place where the effect of our number was measured and captured across every country globally and subnationally in some jurisdictions uh, and machine readable estimates were published on a dedicated website which then allowed these estimations to be used to be compared with factors of interest and um, looking at behavioral patterns climate control measures pathogen biology um, and it, we saw this in the range of analyses that these packages were able to to produce so uh, colleagues from near and far took them and used them to estimate transmission advantage of new COVID variants um, or assessing the severity of infection of variant um, and I think moving on from that there was another example um, of my colleague Adam Kucharski and team um, developing a transferable analysis framework which looked at trying to ascertain the number of COVID cases which were missed in early 2020 and then was subsequently reused by teams in Spain, Australia, India, Switzerland in, in their own analyses. Um, and these were really examples of, of tools which were developed where we could see a clear reuse case, we could see them being employed by others in doing their analyses. Um, but these were exciting and laudable products, but their development was born really out of necessity and in a hugely reactive and time intensive fashion. Um, and that's kind of indicative of how outbreak, outbreak analytics tools have been developed within the context of academic institutions. And um, so typically there hasn't been dedicated resource or investment for the development of these products. And um, as I mentioned before, funding is provided to answer specific questions or look into specific disease types or pathogens, which it does lead to the development of tools which focus on specific use cases and um, which, which have their merit for sure. Um, but don't really allow us to develop these generic tools that would allow people to compare a range of different setting specific questions or policy scenarios. And um, so that's that's really where Epiverse kind of steps in and attempts to address this problem in our context. Um, and it, it, the funding, it's not a research grant. It's there to provide support, but to uh, proactively build this scalable, well-evaluated and production ready set of tools um, that really will be ready to use and deploy in the event of the next pandemic or the next ep epidemic when it inevitably occurs. Um, and we really, we took inspiration from initiatives like uh, the Tidyverse, um, where, which curate a, a toolkit of data science packages. And the intention is to establish something similar and speaking back to the points about integration, interoperability made earlier around uh, data structures, which share underpinning philosophies and formats which enable them to work well together and be easily and readily applied by end users um, and a, a dedicated that is a dedicated focus within the epiverse um, but epiverse tends to do a lot of different things so we've got 
we've got a number of different pillars of work and packages which will be developed from that, which again, all will be speaking to one another and play nicely together. And um, so we've got tools, we'll be building tools to support with data cleaning and descriptive epidemiology, real-time modeling to assess transmission patterns and um, towards longer term simulations, which can really look at the impact of potential intervention measures. Um, and I think points that have come up um, within this discussion and certainly within our discussions that it's crucial that these tools are easily applicable and relevant. Um, and so we're placing huge investment on training the next, really want to train the next generation of field epis and mathematical modelers. Um, and some of our partners in uh, Colombia in Uniandes and um, Universidad Hatarayana, uh, who are two of our partners, have really, really, they're going to be building on all of the great work that they have done in the past, both with COVID and previous epidemics, um, and really building out dedicated training kits to build up that capacity and to make sure that these tools are generalizable and they are easily usable. Um, and I think touching on the point that Sky made earlier and the amazing work done um, with the Map and Match initiative, we, we really want to learn from initiatives and um, pilots and programs such as this to really get our users involved from the outset. Um, so our intention is that we want to make sure that the most common types of epi data, data can be used easily by analysis tools and that relies on knowing what formats people are working with and working to standardize these as much as possible and um, but really making it as easy as possible for the end users to use our digital tools and apply apply this so we, we want to create tools that are complementary with a range of data collection um, platforms, for example, whether it be REDCap or GoData or whatever it is that people are using and um, ensuring that these tools work well um, and are applicable for that. Um, and yeah, I think making sure that as was raised earlier, it, it's, it's not enough to just go to people now and say, what do you need? what's working, what's not, what are your limitations? We need to keep sustained investment in um, engaging with our partners in countries and um, engaging with local academic institutions. The idea that all of our analysis and all of this development be done in the global north is that that is an outdated and frankly a view that needs to change. Uh, and so it's really exciting to be working with them, um, local partners in country and to have that cross leadership um, and really ensuring that we can, yeah, we can support efforts locally on the ground. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anna. And it's, it's another testament to the power of stubborn optimists in academic institutions and, and, uh, and such powerful software tools that they uh, create and uh, and share with the world as as uh, global goods um i i would like to invite the uh, all of our panelists to uh, the virtual stage uh, i um, i think today we we have covered many important points in in terms of uh, the the critical importance of uh, supporting the promising and mature and safe uh, digital public goods and, and global goods, uh, building capacity and, and uh, fostering collaborations and learning from each other's mistakes and successes. Um, uh, and uh, 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 like I said, I think it, it's, it's really uh, important to, uh, uh, to come together and, and, uh, and, and share examples uh, of, the, of the success and uh, it has been a, a great pleasure for me to uh, to uh, have this panel with you today. Thank you all so much uh, for making the time and thank you uh, for the participants who uh, have joined us um, uh, today. It has really been a pleasure. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of uh, the Ecosystem Day events and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.